Well, good evening and welcome to our Wednesday night Bible study. For those of you that are online, we've just been praying right now, so that's why we're a little bit late. And it might uh, be like that from now on. So we're glad that you are with us. We know that there's a number of you that consistently watch on Wednesday night, and we are grateful for you. And if you would like us to pray for you, you can uh, just text me a prayer request and we can make sure we pray for you during our prayer time on Wednesday night. It won't be uh, publicized, but we will pray here at the church. So just text me your prayer request and we will take care of that as well. I want to remind you that this coming Sunday we're going to have a little celebration for uh, our anniversary being here at the church for 35 years. I thought it was 30, but 35? Let's see, somebody do the math. We started in 1986. What is that? Who's good at math? 35. 35? It makes me feel so old, John. I want to, just want to cut it back. <laughs> yeah. So we're going to have a celebration here Sunday after church. We're going to have a little special for you. I can't do, do the details. I don't know why, but uh, all I can say is bring an appetite. All right, so plan to stick around a little bit. We're going to eat outside. We're going to be safe, but we are going to uh, celebrate together. 35 years of ministry here on this corner. And I, I know John has been with us the whole time, and Gilbert Longoria and his family. Who else? Who else has been here the whole uh, I think, Marissa, you've been here just about, you were here when you were just a little gal. And uh, so, Bernardo. Bernardo, yeah, he was just a little guy here. And this is all live. The whole world's hearing this. All right, let's get more professional here. Uh, Philippians chapter 2, verse 19. We're going to look this evening at two amazing young men, choice vessels that the Lord used. One of them is Timothy, and the other is Epaphroditus. We're going to learn a number of very interesting things from the lives of, the, of these very special young men. Verse 19 of Philippians chapter 2. But I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you shortly so that I may be encouraged when I learn of your condition. Wait a minute. Isn't Paul in prison? Paul is in prison and he is concerned with the Philippians. He's concerned with how they're doing. So much so that he wants to send his main companion that is with him in prison or at least in the vicinity that assisted him. Paul wants to send Timothy, his main assistant, in prison because Timothy wasn't in prison, only Paul was. He wants to send him to Philippi to see how they're doing. They're not in prison. That's amazing. Paul, while in prison, is willing to sacrifice his number one helper to go see how the Philippians were doing. They weren't in prison. Paul was. But that just shows you his heart. I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you shortly so that I may be encouraged when I learn of your condition. For I have no one else of kindred spirit who will genuinely be concerned for your welfare. In other words, he's the best I've got. I've got a number of helpers, a number of assistants, but he's the best. He's the cream of the crop. I have no one else of kindred spirit. He and I are one soul. We think alike. 
He feels what I feel. He is a kindred soul. I have no one else of kindred spirit who would genuinely be concerned for your welfare. For they all seek after their own interests, not those of Christ Jesus. And then it goes on. Let's look at Timothy. Let's look at this young man named Timothy, Paul's number one assistant. Now what we want to learn from Timothy is that God uses imperfect instruments. Timothy was not a perfect candidate for being a pioneer missionary helping the Apostle Paul. I could think of a lot more uh, a lot more effective and appropriate young men that, than Timothy. But there are, God uses imperfect instruments. First of all, what makes Timothy, you know, not high on the candidate list. If you had a list of people, he wouldn't be at the top of the list. First of all, he was very young. First Timothy. He was so important, Paul wrote two books to. First Timothy 4, verse 12. He was very young. He was a young man. First Timothy 4, 12. Let no one look down on your youthfulness, but rather in speech, conduct, love, faith, and purity, show yourself an example of those who believe. Until I come, give attention to the public reading of Scripture, to exhortation and teaching. Do not neglect the spiritual gift within you, which was bestowed on you through prophetic utterance, with the laying, with the laying on of hands by the presbytery. Let no one look down on your youthfulness. He was a very young man. Which doesn't place him very high on the list. But God uses young people. He uses young people. Now this, the Jewish culture was a culture that really didn't respect people until they were at least 30 years old. That was kind of the cutoff. 30 years old to be a priest. Timothy was a lot younger than 30. We don't know exactly how old he was, but he was a young man. He was young. But God took this young man and he, he gave him to Paul. And, and the two of them went out, traveled, planted churches, preached, organized. In Asia and in Europe, they had quite a ministry. He was very young. And God used him. God used him. Now, if we had a lot of young people here, I would say God can use you. But you know what? We do. You guys are all youngsters. Eternally speaking. We're just teenagers. Not only was he very young, but he also had another problem. He was kind of timid. He wasn't bold like Paul. He was reserved. Maybe kind of like an introvert. Second Timothy, we read about this. Chapter 1. Second Timothy 1 verse 6. He was kind of timid. Second Timothy 1 verse 6. He probably also needed a lot of instruction and help. So Paul writes him. Two epistles. First Timothy. That didn't do the job. Second Timothy. He didn't learn his lessons in the first epistle. So write, Paul, Paul writes him a second one. Praise God. Praise God. Timothy was a little bit. Uh, 
He needed a lot of instruction because we, we are the recipients of that blessing. We have two letters to Timothy. 2 Timothy 1 verse 6. For this reason, I remind you to kindle afresh. Fire it up. Kindle the fire. It's starting to, it's starting to grow weak, the fire. It's, it's, uh, it's growing weaker. Kindle it. Put some fresh wood. Kindle afresh the gift of God which is in you. You have a gift. God has gifted you. Put some wood in the fire. Through the laying on of my hands, for God has not given us a spirit of timidity, but of power and love and discipline. Timothy, read through the lines. Timothy is growing timid. Timid Timothy. He's getting timid. And Paul has to encourage him to kindle afresh. Don't allow your critics to extinguish the fire that you once had. Don't allow them to douse you with water. Keep it, keep, keep the fire, keep the fire going. Verse 8, therefore do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord or of me, his prisoner. But join with me in suffering for the gospel according to the power of God. Do not be ashamed. Maybe Timothy was going through a period where he was, he was pulling back. He was growing timid. He was... Uh, being bullied into silence. Maybe he was feeling a little shame that his mentor is in prison. Paul says, don't be ashamed of me. Don't be ashamed of Jesus. Join us. Join me in suffering for the gospel. So God uses imperfect instruments. Timothy, very young, he was prone to being timid. Matter of fact, there's another text in 1 Corinthians that kind of speaks about uh, Timothy's nature. 1 Corinthians chapter 16. Now, I mean, it's not bad. Not everybody is super aggressive and bold and Courageous. Most actually, most people aren't. Most people are more reserved. They're not going to rush into battle. Chapter 16, verse 10. Now, if Timothy comes, see that he is with you without cause to be afraid. Don't make him scared. I'm sending Timothy to you. He's my choice. He's my son in the faith. When he comes, I don't want him to be afraid. I want you to accept him. Encourage him. See that he's with you. See that he is with you without cause to be afraid. For he's doing the Lord's work as I also am. Just an interesting little de detail there. Maybe Timothy was reserved and prone to fear and timidity. And, uh, but you know what? He pushed past those fears. He did some amazing things. He hung in there with the great apostle Paul. He was timid. Now, not only that, another, in, another imperfect quality. He was sickly. He was kind of sickly. 1 Timothy 5. 1 Timothy 5, verse 23. 1 Timothy 5, 23. No longer drink water exclusively. Now back then, the water supply was suspect. When you go to Mexico, you don't drink water exclusively. 
Matter of fact, you got to be careful. Careful with the water. That's what I was talking to my son because he's down in Mexico. I said, be careful with the water. But he's, he says he drinks just a little bit every day so his body can get used to it. And now he's gulping it. So I guess his body's just accepting it now. No longer drink water exclusively, but use a little wine for the sake of your stomach and your frequent ailments. Obviously, there must have been a medicinal purpose for the wine that would help his stomach issues for the sake of your stomach and your frequent ailments. Wow, that's, that's something you really don't publicize. But now the whole world for all eternity knows that Timothy had a lot of ailments. In other words, he's kind of sick. Frequent ailments, different things, stomach issues, other things might have bothered him. He was, he was a little suspect physically. Frequent ailments. Now, if you had frequent ailments, you didn't really want to be traveling through Asia, through Europe, crossing oceans, crossing deserts. You would kind of wanted to stay put in one area. You didn't want to push your luck, but Timothy was out there. Even though he had a lot of physical problems, a lot of ailments. Ailments. So, he's not a perfect instrument. He got sick a lot. He got sick a lot, which, which was something you didn't want because they didn't have modern medicine. This is 2,000 years ago. I mean, antibiotics wasn't invented or even developed until, what, 18... Uh, any smart people in here? Uh, antibiotics, penicillin... The 1800s, we'll say 100 years, maybe 120 years ago. Prior to that, what happened if you got an infection? Wow. You can go to urgent care, Kaiser or wherever. What happened? Well, there was, you just died a lot of times. You just, you just died. You couldn't go get a COVID vaccine because there were no vaccines. So if, you, if your body was prone to frequent ailments, you were not an ideal candidate to go off and conquer the world for Jesus Christ, but God uses imperfect instruments. And Timothy raised his hand and said, I'll go with you, Paul. I'm not the strongest. I'm not the bravest. I'm not the most mature, but I am here for you. I'll be a good assistant. And he was. He was. So he was sickly. Here's another, here's another uh, thing on the bad list. Here's another demerit that Timothy had. He was mixed race. <sighs> he was like a Mexican. He had, he had European blood, he had Indian blood. So well, Mexican, what kind, of, what kind of European blood do you have? Name it. Spaniards came over, the French came over, the... Irish. Did they? The Irish? French. French. A little mix of everything. Now, look at Acts chapter 16, verse 1. He was mixed. Now, this was at a time when... I mean, if you were a Jew, there were Jews and Gentiles, and they kind of stayed separate. They didn't mix too much. Jews married other Jews. And they traveled around the world. They colonized everywhere, but they pretty much were insulated and stayed together. 
Gentiles did their thing over here and Jews did their thing and very, very rarely did they mix. You didn't put a Jew and a Gentile together, but Timothy was half Jew, half Greek. Kind of an interesting combination. Chapter 16, verse 1, Paul, all, Paul came also to Derby and to Lystra, and a disciple was there. He was already a disciple. How'd that happen? The gospel was just spreading, just spreading around. There was a disciple there named Timothy, the son of a Jewish woman who was a believer. But his father was a Greek. Was a Greek. So he was half Jewish and half Greek. He was half Gentile and half Jewish. <coughs> Which presented some complications. Which Paul took care of. Look at verse 3. Paul wanted this man to go with him. And he took him and circumcised him. He was not circumcised as a baby. Why? His daddy was Greek. Greeks didn't get circumcised. But Paul took him and got him circumcised. Because of the Jews who were in those parts. For they all knew that his father was a Greek. Paul wanted to remove any obstacle to the gospel, so he said, you know what, we're going to have to circumcise you so that these Jews don't think you are uh, some godless Gentile. Because your dad was. His mother was a believer, his dad was not. He was mixed. Now, that might seem like a real negative thing, but that was perfect. That was perfect for what Paul needed. Because in Acts chapter 9, Paul was the apostle to the Gentiles. He, he worked with Jews as well, but his primary focus was the Gentiles. Acts 9 verse 1, Now Saul, this is before he became Paul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples. You know, just drop down to verse 15. But the Lord said to him, Go for he's a chosen instrument of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the sons of Israel. But his primary focus was the Gentiles. Acts chapter 22, <coughs> verse 21. And he said to me, go, for I will send you far away to the Gentiles. And in chapter 26, verse 18. To open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light. Actually, verse 17. Rescuing you from the Jewish people and from the Gentiles to whom I'm sending you. I'm sending you to the Gentiles, to the non-Jews. I'm sending you to the Gentiles to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light, from the dominion of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who have been sanctified by faith in me. Paul's main target audience were the Gentiles. So it helped him to have a Gentile along, at least a half Gentile. Didn't hurt. Here's my assistant. Oh, by the way, he's half Gentile. His dad was a Greek. It kind of helped out. It helped. It, di it, didn't, it, it didn't help in Jewish circles. But Paul's main ministry was not to the Jews. It was to the Gentiles. And to have an assistant that was half Gentile. That's good. So he was mixed race. <clears throat> and here's, a, here's the last 
We're looking at uh, God uses imperfect instruments. Here's the fifth one. He was raised pretty much by women. Second Timothy. Not that that's bad, but it doesn't seem like his dad was too involved in his life. Maybe he was dead. We don't know. It's always best to be raised by a father and a mother. It's the best way to go. It's not the greatest to be raised by two fathers or two mothers. Sorry for being politically incorrect and Facebook might just take us down, but it's best to be raised by a father and a mother. 2 Timothy 1 verse 5. For I am mindful of the sincere faith within you. He's talking to Timothy. Which first dwelt in your grandmother, Lois. And your mother, Eunice. And I'm sure that it is in you as well. Hey, where's grandpa? We know about grandma Lois. How come grandpa's not named there? And we know your mother Eunice, but where's dad's name? They weren't, either they weren't involved or they weren't believers or they had died. It appears that Timothy was raised primarily by his grandmother, his mother. Or possibly his mother was a believer and his dad wasn't. So it's kind of a blended situation. He wasn't raised by a strong, believing couple, mother, father, together, raising their children. No, his mother was a sincere believer as well as his grandmother, but I don't know where the men were. I don't know where the men were. It doesn't seem like they were that involved. Which usually is not a great combination. But God overcomes. He overcomes a less than perfect upbringing. A less than perfect upbringing. And which one of us had a perfect upbringing? None. None. My daughter was doing a family tree. She got into that, uh, she's doing her master's degree at APU, and uh, she thought it'd be great to do a family tree. I said, be careful, those trees have some gnarly branches. And uh, sure enough, all right, Dad, tell me about your family. All right, and tell, tell me about my biological mom's family and my uh, current mom's family. And so I go, okay, let's go, let's do the three, because the one nurtured you, one bore you, so you gotta do both lines, right? Uh, biological mom, no longer with us, so you gotta look at her family line. And there's some knots in that tree, okay? Okay, look at your nurturing mother that raised you. And there's some interesting knots there. And look at your biological dad's line. Well, we don't want to talk about that. So basically, you don't have a whole lot of hope. I said, you know, you got to go all the way back. You want to do a family tree. You want to find out why the, why the family lines are so messed up. You got to go all the way back to your father, 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 Adam. Adam and your mother Eve from them from Genesis chapter 3 the human family got all twisted up and here we are thousands of years down the line and you wonder why you don't have a perfect family tree that's why now when you get saved you can kind of smooth out some of those things, but basically the human family is pretty twisted. 
Someday God will reverse the curse. But for now, we have to deal with it. <clears throat> now, so Timothy, God uses an imperfect instrument. He was very young. He was kind of timid, reserved, prone to being ashamed. He wasn't very courageous. He was sickly. He had a lot of ailments. He was of mixed race, which didn't do too well with the Jewish crowd. Probably didn't help out much with the Gentiles. And he was raised by women alone. The fathers seemed to be out of the picture. But God used Timothy because he was willing. He was a willing instrument. Look at Philippians chapter 2. This is what God uses. You might say, well, you know, I, I am not the, I'm not a perfect instrument. You don't have to be. Timothy wasn't. You just have to be willing. Willing. <clears throat> a willing instrument. Philippians 2 verse 19. But I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you shortly. So that I may be encouraged when I learn of your condition. So Paul says, I'm going to send Timothy to you. Where is Paul? He's in Rome. He's in prison. Timothy is assisting Paul. Timothy is not actually in prison, but he is free to come and go. He is Paul's assistant. He's been traveling with Paul. And Paul says, I'm going to send Timothy to you shortly. Verse 23. Same chapter. But I thought it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus. I thought it necessary to send you Epaphroditus, my brother and fellow worker and fellow soldier, who is also your messenger and minister to my need. Basically, what I want to look at here is that Timothy is with Paul. But he's available to go wherever Paul tells him. Paul says, I'm going to send Timothy to you shortly. I'm going to send him to you. It doesn't say that he conferred with Timothy, that he asked Timothy, that he... Uh, he pretty much just said, I'm going to send him. I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you shortly. Timothy was willing to go wherever he was called on. I want to send you here. I want to send you there. Timothy was, he was okay with that. He was okay with that. He was available, basically. You need me here, I'll stay. You want me to go back to Philippi? Philippi was a long way from Rome, by the way. Rome is over here in Italy. And you had to get on a boat and you got to cross the Aegea, the Mediterranean Sea, and you gotta, you got to go around the uh, Adriatic Sea to get to Philippi, which was by Greece, or in Greece. It's a long journey. Timothy's with Paul, and Paul said, I'm going to send him to you. He was willing. He's willing to go. He's a willing instrument. Send me wherever you need me, Paul. Don't worry about it. I'm good to go. He's also a team player. A beautiful word is introduced right here in Philippians 2, verse 20. For I have no one else of kindred spirit. That's such a nice word that there is a chain of hospitals called kindred. Kindred spirit. What does kindred mean? It means one soul, one heart. Our hearts beat as one. It's good for like a husband and wife. We are kindred spirits. We share our values, our heart, our interests. We have all things in common. We're like this. We're together. We're kindred spirits. Paul says Timothy is a kindred spirit. We think alike. We feel alike. We share the same interests. 
a kindred spirit. Basically, Timothy was a team player. When he got on the team, he said, I, I'm all in. You don't have to worry about me. I share your interests. I want what you want. We serve the same Lord. I'm on the team. You don't have to worry about me. I'm not a freelancer. I'm not an independent contractor. I'm not a backstabber. I'm not going to use you to, to build my own little group and then when I leave, I'm taking all my clients with me. No, I'm, I'm on the team. He's a team player. He's a team player. A kindred spirit. Now, that, that idea of kindred spirit is... A, is a, it's a great word for relationships and marriage. So who, who should I marry? Who should I marry? Well, marry a kindred spirit. Someone that shares your values, another Christian. Someone that shares your goals. If you want a large family, and he doesn't want any kids. You're not kindred spirits. Why are you going to marry him? He doesn't want kids. He told you. I don't want any kids. I don't like them. But you want a large family. Well, you're not kindred spirits. You're not kindred spirits. You, you, you got to be on the same team. Same team. Now, another thing about Timothy. He was genuine. Look at verse 20. For I have no one else of kindred spirit who will genuinely be concerned with your welfare. That's another beautiful word. Genuine. What does that word mean? Genuine. Authentic. Real. Sincere. Not fake. Not false. Not deceptive. But authentic. What you see is what you get. Not putting on a false front. I'm not wearing a mask. Someone that is real. Someone that is sincere. Paul, Timothy was genuine. He was genuine. That's why God used him. He was genuine. He was the real deal. He wasn't fake. He was truth. He was also proven, chapter 2, verse 22. But you know of his proven worth. Proven worth. He's tried and tested. He has a track record. He's not a Johnny-come-lately. He's been through the fires. He's been through the wars. He's a proven commodity. You know of his proven worth that he served with me in the furtherance of the gospel like a child serving his father. He's proven. We went to battle together. And he was like a child serving his father. He had my back and I had his back. He was proven. So Timothy, used by God. Timothy had some things against him. We looked at those. He was young and timid and sickly, mixed race, raised by women. But God used him because he was available. He was a team player. He, he, he was genuine, he was proven, and he was submissive. He was a child serving his father. Now, let's look at the second guy here. Epaphroditus. Verse 23, Therefore I hope to send him immediately as soon as I see how things go with me. He's my first choice, Timothy. He's my number one choice. I'm going to send him immediately. He's my number one choice. Everybody knew that. Verse 24. And I trust in the Lord that I myself also will be coming shortly. I think I'm going to get released. But I thought it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus. Now what does that say about Epaphroditus? Epaphroditus knew that he wasn't Paul's first choice. Timothy was the first choice. 
But Paul says, I'm going to send Epaphroditus. He's my second choice. How, how would you like to be the second choice? No problem. Because Epaphroditus was humble. He didn't mind playing second fiddle. I really want to send Timothy, but I can't do it right now. I'm going to send you Epaphroditus. He didn't mind it. Because Epaphroditus said basically, you know what? I'm a spare tire. I'm like a spare tire. Put me wherever you need me. You need me in the back, right? Put me there. Front, left, put me there. Doesn't matter. I'm a spare tire. Put me where you need me. I don't care if I'm your second choice. I don't care if I'm your first choice. He was humble. Beautiful quality. Beautiful quality. He was also flexible. Look at verse 25. But I thought it necessary to send you Epaphroditus, my brother. And here's a beautiful description of him. My brother, fellow worker, fellow soldier, who is also your messenger and minister to my need. Because he was longing for you all and was distressed because you had heard that he was sick. Now what's going on here? The Philippian church sent one of their own, Epaphroditus, to Paul. The Philippians heard that Paul was in trouble. So they took up a love offering. Philippians 4 verse 18. They took up a love offering and they gave it to Epaphroditus and said, I want you to take this to Paul. And I want you to minister to Paul because he's in trouble. Philippians 4.18, But I have received everything in full and have an abundance. I am amply supplied, having received from Epaphroditus what you have sent a fragrant aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. I got the love offering you sent me through Epaphroditus. So Epaphroditus was a choice servant of the church in Philippi, and he came to Paul with a financial love gift. But then while he's with Paul, he gets sick and almost dies. He almost dies. That's what verse 25 is about. Verse 26, because he was, long, he was longing for his home, his church. And he became distressed because you had heard that he was sick. The church in Philippi had got word that their man, Epaphroditus, that they had sent to Paul was really sick. And they began, they got really worried about him. And Epaphroditus hears about them and their worry. And now he's worried or distressed. He's distressed because they're so distressed about him. For you, because he was longing for you all and was distressed because you had heard he was sick. For indeed he was sick. To the point of death. But God had mercy on him. And not on him only, but also on me. So that I would not have sorrow upon sorrow. Therefore I have sent him all the more eagerly. So that when you see him again, you may rejoice. And I may be less concerned about you. Receive him then in the Lord. With joy. And hold men like him in high regard. Because he came close to death for the work of Christ. Risking his life to complete what was deficient in your service to me. Epaphroditus. He was a risk taker. It was risky to travel in the ancient world. There was all kinds of diseases. When you travel from one continent to another, you don't know what you're going to encounter. It was dangerous, especially to go to a big crowded city like Rome. Rome had people there crowded from all different parts of the empire. 
People there from North Africa, people from the East, people from Europe, all crowd into the empire's capital. That was a risky play. That was like a petri dish for disease. Epaphroditus knew that. He knew that, he knew that it was dangerous. But he was a risk taker. That's what it says right there in verse 30. He was a gambler in a good sense. Matter of fact, the early church, there was a special word that they used in describing people that risked their lives for Christ. People that gambled for Christ. The word is paraboleomai. Paraboleomai. Paraboleomai, Greek. It means to gamble, to risk your life. Life is risky. It's risky to be alive, especially when you come to diseases, especially in the ancient world, where there was no cures, no medicine. Matter of fact, you didn't want to go to the doctor. They made things worse. They bleed you. <laughs> your chin is a good bleeding. They cut you. Oh, they put le well, leeches weren't that bad. Leeches were actually therapeutic, but they bleed you. So Epaphroditus got deathly sick. He almost died of what? We don't know. We don't know what he got. Did he get an infection? Did he get a bacterial infection or a virus? What did he get? We don't know. Did he get the coronavirus? We don't know. The plague? Leprosy? We don't know what he got. But Paul says, hold men like him in high regard. He came close to death for the work of Christ, risking his life to complete what was deficient in your service to me. He reminds me of a modern missionary that goes out to, to uh, I'm thinking of one of our missionaries, uh, went out to Argentina. I mean, that's not, not exactly uh, the jungles, but... And have, they had four, three or four kids out there. It's kind of risky. That's kind of risking your life. Going to a third world country. Having children. Who does that? Missionaries do that. Hold them in high regard. Hold them in high regard. I think about Luke Maripol. He has a heart condition. His wife has cancer and he's not supposed to fly, but every year he flies to India and holds crusades for two straight weeks. He's not supposed to do that because he has a heart condition, so he just prays and says, God, protect me. I got to go to India. He's risking his life for the cause of the gospel. Pray for men like Luke Maripol. Pray for men like Chaplain Manley, who goes into the hospitals and the COVID wards and ministers to people. It's risky business. Life is risky. Life is risky. But Epaphroditus, he was a gambler for Christ. Say, Pastor, is it good to gamble? As long as you're gambling for Christ. It says it right there, he took risks. So, we're going to close up now. We've looked at two very special men, young men. Timothy and Epaphroditus. Both different. Both instruments used by God to assist the great apostle Paul, if you're looking for a role model, you got two right here, two right there, powerful young role models for Jesus Christ, to God be the glory. Let us bow in a word of prayer as we ask our usher to come forward. Let us thank the Lord. Our Heavenly Father, thank you for these two 
very, very special young men. Different but similar in that they risked their lives. One of them got sick all the time, frequent ailments. One of them almost died of something. They risked their lives. They gambled for the cause of Jesus Christ. Oh, Father, raise up some risk takers that are willing to move out of the comfort zones of security to do something great for you. Father, we pray you would bless this offering, that you would use it for your glory and honor. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.